Welcome to the Bob Ellis HealthCast, episode number 509, Dissociative Amnesia and Dissociative Feud. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moffin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. This week, we're talking about a concept that I think is more directly relevant to work that I have done and mm-hmm. experience that yes. I have had than mm-hmm. to hormone replacement uh, as a concern for your office mm-hmm. and your practice. But these things do come to you by backdoor presentation. People come in with complaints and symptoms and concerns. And when you hear what these are and you look at the blood tests and see the results that you get, sometimes you make a referral to somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, this is an area in which I don't have expertise, but it contributes to the difficulties that you're having. Mm-hmm. Or we can measure blood test and data and say, if you're having this symptomology, it's not manifested by our clinical results. By hormones. It's by not hormones. hormonal so, or metabolic. So, so it shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but something's interfering with your understanding of the process. It's outside of, your of my scope, so I yeah. have to send so them to refer a it to somebody. psychologist. So then you ask me about it, and counselor. you say, explain what's going on here yeah. to me. I did. That's what I did, actually. <laughs> this was stimulated by a case. Yeah, a specific case of, of young to middle-aged man who was suffering from what I call fugue states. And this, the fugue states are identified... Uh, in the DSM-4 and the DSM-5, which are the clinical, the diagnostic and statistical manuals of the American Psychiatric Association, which people like me, who are licensed to practice mental health care, uh, have to use as a reference. Uh, this, is a, this is the label, these are the codes, these are the numbers that identify what somebody's dealing with, as we understand it. And when I was taught almost 40 years ago, the understanding of amnesia, and fugue states, and even what they called 40 years ago multiple personality disorder, was that it was on a continuum, on a straight-line continuum, from the development of the defense mechanism of repression. That if you have experiences that overwhelm your system, you learn to repress your awareness of those. You, You filter it out. You block it so that you don't feel it. You don't see it. You don't know it. Uh, parts of you do, parts of you still see it, but you as yourself don't, and you automatically protect yourself by that. And normal people can do this. Everybody this does. Everybody, it. everybody does, does it. So this is a uh, normal protection. One of the for most yourself. normal examples I can give you: if you're in a stressful situation at work, or you're worried about financial situations at home, and you're preoccupied and and uh, focused on those concerns, and you get in the car to drive, you may drive from work to home and not be aware of anything that you saw on the way. Mm -hmm. Kids crossing at the light when you stopped in front of the school, Uh, a car accident on the side of the road, you you get home and your partner says, hey, did you see the car accident Mm -hmm. on X and Y intersection? Mm -hmm. And you drive past it every day and you're like, well, I drove through there, but no, I didn't see anything. Your mind, your body will still function. I mean, you see a red light, you stop. You drive the car, you keep appropriate distance from other cars, you maintain the speed limit, but you don't have any awareness of what's going on around you because you're hyper focused or hyper blocked mm-hmm. one way or the other. So mm-hmm. repression is that kind of protective defense where if things concern you unduly and raise levels of anxiety and distress, you block them as much as you can. And so everybody does that. Mm-hmm. Some people have more critical experiences, more difficult experiences. Uh, a lot of what we experience now, because we've been a nation at war for more than 20 years, we have soldiers who have war trauma that they experience that compounds, it takes this essential defense mechanism of repression and turns it into what we call dissociation. You dissociate, you disconnect mm-hmm. from your awareness of things, your memory of events, your uh, fear and anxiety of certain things. And a lot of people in critical care professions 
learn how to dissociate. Mm -hmm. Surgeons have to learn how we to dissociate. We were discussing this, and that's, I mean, one of the hardest things to learn as you, you have to learn it fast yeah. as you're delivering babies or you're doing surgery or you're doing emergencies because gynecologists have ruptured ectopics. People's life is in the balance. No matter what's happening around you, no matter how loud it is, no matter if there's banging outside, no matter if, if it's freezing or if it's hot or if you're in pain or if you have a terrible headache, you block all of that. You don't feel any of that because you have to concentrate on getting this person. So you hyper-focus. So you hyper-focus. You have to get this person out of the operating room alive and you right. have to you have to save their life or you have you have to make sure that nothing bad happens, no complications, no nothing. So you don't, if there's a tornado, we were taught, if there's a tornado coming and that patient's still open, you stay there, you stand there. You don't move the patient. You can't move the patient when they're open. You stand there until that patient is stable, closed, and on her way out of the operating room. You have. And that's, that's basically one of the things that you learn to dissociate from everything. You had an experience like that where you were doing surgery and the people who were attending your surgery, the nurses and other physicians, started passing out. There was an mm -hmm. oxygen problem in there the room. There was a carbon monoxide carbon problem. Monoxide. They, they had a generator right over our operating room that, that vented into our operating room. And it usually happened a little bit, according to the nurses, but this was big. Yeah. And I had a patient open who was... Had it having her fourth C-section, and she right. she had a big baby, and she wasn't small. And it was hard to get in. It was just as hard to get out. So when this happened, we hadn't even gotten the baby out. Yeah. You, normally, I can get in and out like that if, if there's not a lot of scar tissue. But we hadn't gotten the baby out, and basically, I'm concentrating, and all of a sudden, the nurse next to me just drops to the floor. She passes out, and then my circulating nurse passes out. My resident didn't. I don't know why. She was still working with me, and we were struggling to get the baby out. I was not dissociated enough to n not know what was happening. I smelled exhaust. But you were hyper-focused on getting the results before anything else right. intruded. I could not leave that patient. I, right. couldn't, I couldn't pass it out. I right. couldn't, so I had everybody put oxygen on the mother and the husband and the baby and get the baby out of the room. But then I had to stay there and close her up no matter what was happening around me. I had no circuit. I had no nurse. Yeah. We were, we were pulling instruments off the table ourselves, right. trying to get her closed. And then I started dropping instruments. So I had to leave and they brought in another resident to finish, to finish the skin. Yeah. But that was, but that's how you have, what you have to do. That's yeah. your responsibility. It's like you go down with the ship. So there's a lot of research that shows that emergency care nurses uh, special forces operatives, police officers have trauma history backgrounds. Meaning they've been traumatized. They've been traumatized. They've been in the presence of trauma, which is what the uh, reason I brought this up is we were talking about veterans. Veterans who've been exposed to war-based trauma often become dissociative as a way to survive. And so when you take the continuum from the severity of, of the development of normal, everyday, everybody defense mechanism of repression, and you pull it to a more severe or extreme end, then you get into the what's called what are called the dissociative processes, where you learn how to disconnect part of your awareness, hyper focus on something else, mm -hmm. so that you're not intruded upon by these things that are, could be overwhelming for you, so that you can still function as best you can. These but in those cases, you may not remember anything you did during that time. Exactly. Or you may not act like yourself. Yeah. Or you may go off, you may drive off and find yourself lost. Yeah. And not know exactly how to get home. I, and I, those are things that happen to real people who have been traumatized earlier in life or right or the memory comes back. Right. And this trauma triggers this and to the normal person watching, they don't know there's anything wrong with them, and they just think they know what no, they're doing. No, but you still can, you appear to function. You can make change. You can drive a car. You can answer questions that are like fact-based questions. You know, uh, what room is Doctor Smith operating mm -hmm. on? Uh, you can answer that question, but your sense of self is disrupted. Uh, there are memory gaps. When we we talk about lifetime memories. You can have. What are, what are called vertical memories. I'm 73 years old. I remember something that happened yesterday, but I can also remember something that happened when I was five. Horizontal memory loss is when you lose a gap. Uh, I've had a number of my clients who've come in through the years with, that suffered from dissociative process disorders, mm -hmm. one of which is amnesia, which 
can be more global. But these people had dissociative process disorders where because of trauma that they experienced in childhood could be being present at the death of a parent or the assault of a parent. I was with my mom and she got robbed and beaten up, horrified me so much, I lost it. I don't, I don't remember have that, that year. Re- I don't remember the whole damn year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had any number of clients that lost like their first six years of school or their third grade year because something horrific happened to them in that third grade year. So they don't remember any of it. They know they went to third grade. They have a documentation of, hey, I got a grade. I had Mrs. Mm-hmm. Smith. But they don't remember Mrs. Smith, and they don't remember anything that happened in third grade. And nobody knew they were going through this. They just thought they were they were going to school, and they didn't know how, how traumatic it was. You know, the system often precludes that. Mm-hmm. Uh, teachers are mandated reporters. If I become aware that a child is being abused in some way as a mandated reporter, I have to contact the authorities and say, hey, investigate mm-hmm. this situation. Families that perpetrate those kind of abuses mm-hmm. on their children teach their children not to provide any information. Mm-hmm. You don't talk about this outside the, the right. home. It's a secret. One of the classic rules of the alcoholic family is we never talk outside the family about alcoholism. Right. You know, I, my dad was a violent alcoholic growing up. Uh, and I was taught, and he, he had a responsible position for much of the time of his life. Uh, we get a phone call for a business call for him, and I was never allowed to say, oh, he's passed out drunk on the mm-hmm. couch. You know, I'll, mm-hmm. have him, I'll take a message and have him call you back. Mm-hmm. I, I, I learned how to reflexively say, he's asleep, he's not feeling well, mm-hmm. he's not home, uh, and lie mm-hmm. to protect the image to the outside world mm-hmm. that we had a normal family. So that, that's mm-hmm. pretty typical. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and so it, it doesn't always lead to the extreme form of dissociation, but it can. Sometimes it does. Dissociative amnesia as opposed to psychogenic amnesia. You, you can which, have— which, What is psychogenic? Uh, psychogenic is, as I understand it, uh, caused by emotional trauma. And dissociative can be caused by emotional trauma, but it, it can also be caused by— uh, physiological change mm-hmm. in in the you know, what, help me with the word again. What am in I? The hippocampus. In the hippocampus mm-hmm. uh, and the amygdala. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have trauma, we've now learned as a child, especially or young adult, if you have trauma in those years, it can literally change the way your brain processes and remembers data. It rewires you. Yeah, it rewires your memory paths. It blocks out certain areas. Uh, one of the ways, and, and, and part of how we know this now, is we have new technology that can map and track what your brain is doing MRIs. when you remember things mm-hmm. uh, and show where the activity mm-hmm. centers are and the heat centers are. But uh, so, so you have dissociative amnesia. Something's happened to you. You lose these things. I would have clients that would come in that would say, I took my children to the library. I sat down to read a book while they were looking for things mm-hmm. to get. And... Two hours passed. The kids came up and said, the library's closing, or we're hungry, You know, it's time for dinner. And I felt like we'd been there 10 minutes. I didn't mm-hmm. understand. I looked at my watch and I was surprised, where'd that time go? And when they come to somebody like me, that won't be a unique occurrence. It'll be something mm-hmm. that's starting to happen, lot. scattershot throughout their mm-hmm. lives. They're losing time. They don't know that mm-hmm. they are losing it at the time, but they're being held accountable. You showed up late for work, where were you? You went out for a lunch break. You didn't come back for two hours. Well, no, mm-hmm. I just was gone 10 minutes, mm-hmm. you know. <coughs> Those things create disturbance in the field, and they say, I'm crazy. I'm going crazy. So then we start to do investigations and conversations about trauma histories. So that's remote trauma. Trauma that happened a long time ago can end up rewiring you so that you have these weird these weird behavioral issues now. Yeah. So going back to find the trauma helps you. If, if we can. If Reorganize we can. Yeah. Yes. the brain. But although the brain's already rewired, I don't know if it can re-rewire. The, our belief is that it can be, okay. that we can make positive changes. Um, we were talking fugue about, states. We were talk, okay, go ahead. I'm, well, I'm I, I just want to make case. this distinction because okay. there, there are like three levels. There's mm-hmm. dissociative amnesia, there's a fugue state, and then there's what they call dissociative identity disorder. They used to call it multiple personality mm-hmm. disorder. So it's increasing mm-hmm. intensities. Fugue state is when they have amnesia about who they are, where they live, where they work, what they're doing. They have a break, and they have a compulsion to move, to go somewhere. 
So very often they'll go out and get in the car and just drive they aimlessly. They break with their own personalities, right? Yes. And yeah. if you stop them and say, you know, what are you doing here? Uh, who are you? What's your name? They don't know. They can't answer the question. Mm -hmm. They're, it, it, they don't know what's – or they come back. They finally surface. They've spent maybe half a day just driving randomly around mm -hmm. the town. Then they look up and say, oh, I need to go home. And they go home, and they don't know where they've been. They don't know what they've done. Mm -hmm. They remember being at work and breaking for lunch, and mm -hmm. then now they're coming home. Mm -hmm. So that's called a fugue state. Mm -hmm. to say. And, and in extreme form, you have people in a fugue state that literally move to another town and mm -hmm. assume a name and, a, and an identity and start living there. And they said it, it, when they become recognized and identified, they swear, that's not my wife. Those aren't my children. I don't know what they're talking about. Why are they saying these things about me? I live here. This is my life. So they broke completely from their last reality. There, and they never, and they don't. There are remember. those cases. It's extremely rare, but it does, mm -hmm. it has happened. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you get to the more extreme form, which is multiple personality or dissociative identity disorder. Uh, and these people develop complete personas that they alternate among who have different names, different personality patterns, different skills like playing the piano. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I speak in French. No, I don't speak French, but one personality will speak fluent French. And it's, it's amazing. And if you, ta if you examine those people, yeah. they have different blood work. They have different neurologic yeah. tests. They have different cardiac it's, it's, it's tests. It's amazing what the body can it's do. what the brain does yeah. to the rest of the body because yeah. everything changes. The whole physiology changes when they go from being Annie to Joan. Right. They, they, if I'm drunk changes. as Annie and I get in trouble because I'm drunk, I get uh -huh. pulled over, and they want to take my blood test, my brain will change that out, and it won't show up that I'm drunk on the blood test because I've switched. Right. Right. And we don't know how that happens. We don't I mean, that's know how amazing. that happens. That's another one of those mysteries. If we could figure that out, we could solve the drunk driving problem. We could solve a lot of diseases by using our brain. Yeah. I mean, that would be so nice. But, yeah. but the, um, So in this continuum, I think we're talking about the fugue state, the patient that, that yeah. I talked about, a young man who, um, who drank too much and drank too much at an event and disappeared from all his friends, just yeah. left. And... They called him and they tried to find him, and they. But it was a crowded event, and they found him five miles away in a hotel lobby. He finally like woke up and called them. Yeah, came to and himself. Doesn't know. He wasn't asleep. No. Uh, he, but I mean, he was functioning, and he could drive a car. He could make change. He could sign a registry. He could check himself into a hotel, but he didn't know that he was supposed to be at this event. Right. Or. Where the people were that he, he was had been with, with. Until, exactly until he came to himself, yeah. and then he, you know, he remembered he was supposed to call them, and it was many hours later, yeah, and it probably was when the alcohol decreased. Well, we so don't know. You told right. me alcohol is it can be one of those. It can open the door to it. Triggers, or right? Now, it, it, it's I don't think it's a standalone thing. Yeah, there are neurological complications that can happen from if you have a, fell on your head, if you got hit. With a baseball bat, you know, that you can have physiological amnesia because you got brain damage. You were in a car wreck, your brain mm -hmm. was damaged, and you lose those memories. Mm -hmm. But psychological amnesia, psychological fugue states generally have uh, emotional trauma triggers. And sometimes the, the state, the episode, can be triggered by a smell, a sound, a sight. Something that you don't recognize at the time bonds to any other experience that you've had, mm -hmm. but it sets it off. Right. This individual was abusing uh, an excessive amount of alcohol. We don't know if that triggered it or that uh, opened the door mm -hmm. to that. We know the outcome was this fugue state that happened. Mm -hmm. So then you say, okay, is this a standalone unique occurrence mm -hmm. or is there a history of this or there patterns of this? And so you start trying to track down what is the background, what are the histories, what, if anything, was the trauma, mm -hmm. how do you experience it, how does it present itself, what can we do to get a handle on it? Do you have any, do you have any witnesses of another one? Because they don't usually remember yeah. that they did this, except that they find well, that they well, found they, themselves But when away. they start, if they show up for therapy, they've had some set of circumstances that bring them to therapy. Mm -hmm. So my guess is it's a multiple 
presentation, a multiple breakdown, a fugue state, but also a loss of time. Mm -hmm. uh, they have clothes in their closet they, they didn't buy, they don't remember buying. It's like, mm -hmm. where'd this come from? Don't know. Did you steal it? Did you buy it? Who, mm -hmm. Somebody give it to you? Don't know. It's just there. Don't know how it got there. I didn't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. They have people that stop them and say, Bill, your name is Tom. I met you last week at the mm -hmm. convention and such and such, and you that don't. That has to be freaky. It's really freaky, and they get they're terrified. It's like, why is this happening to me? What's mm -hmm. going on? But it is a pattern of presentation, mm -hmm. so you have to examine the pattern. So the point of all this conversation is, we are getting better able to identify these circumstances with the methodology, the scientific material, the testing that we can do. Mm -hmm. But it still goes back to our primitive understanding of psychology. Uh, the defense mechanism, mechanisms that we develop. And all behaviors, I have been taught and I believe, operate in service of the self. So even multiple personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder, is a protective behavior. Mm -hmm. You are trying to function in a way that makes you able to survive. You don't know what's causing you to behave this way, but the behavior pattern itself says, I need help. And then we began to look into it and try to find ways to help you so that you have more control over what's happening to you. So you can get better. You can get better. Exactly. Right. Uh, and the argument in the field is you can't get cured. Uh, you will always have this skill. And you and I had this mm -hmm. conversation. If it's a protective mm -hmm. skill for me able to just come in and be somebody else, then I'll always be able to do that when I need to. But I don't want it to take over my life and do it when I don't want it to. Right. So... Uh, mm -hmm. the theories used to be that you could consolidate all these personalities into a single new or pre-existing personality and not break out anymore, not fragment anymore. Now the main theories are you can create a team that will work together <laughs> so that your life is functional and you don't get arrested, you don't get broke, you don't get uh, mm -hmm. disabled in some horrible set of circumstances. You can function. So hopefully that will be helpful information if you know somebody that's just dealing with any of these kinds of complex issues. They have to admit it and then go for help. I mean, they have to be able to be aware of it and go for help. Yeah, sometimes Before they have to be confronted with happens it. To yeah. Them when well, they're out there in the world being somebody else. Exactly. So thank you for listening. We appreciate your attention. And this is something that you may not ever have seen, but now you can kind of keep your eyes open for it. <laughs> Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.